I asked all of you to give me questions for a Q&A video, and you did not disappoint. Shall we have a look at some of these questions? Hi, my name is Memo, this is my channel Houseplanty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So yeah, you guys did really well with the questions on this one. I got a good mix of questions. I've got my trusty iPad here, and I think it's over 18 questions, so I think I should be able to get most of them done today. There was a couple of personal ones, I will answer those as well, but I will put them right at the very end of the video because I know that a lot of you are just here for the planty content, but they will be towards the end of the video. I think there's only three actually, so it should be fine. Firstly, let me start off by saying a massive thank you to absolutely everybody for their very kind words for me not being able to post one video a couple of weeks ago now. It's been, it's been a lot. It's been, <laughs> it's been a lot. To be fair, it has got even busier because I never learned from my own mistakes. And there's a few new additions to the household. Let me introduce you to the girls. You probably won't see them through my videos. They are actually on the outside of the conservatory, so you might occasionally hear them. But yes, the girls. And specifically, <laughs> oh, the names are bad. I was trying to go for old school Southern names, and I think I may have done it. <laughs> so there are three girls. One is Delilah, who is a brown silky. Then there is Gracie Lou, which is a speckled silky, and it is Gracie Lou Freebush. Anybody who's watched Miss Congeniality, you know why? And then <laughs> we've got a Polish chicken which is called Blanche after Blanche Devereaux from the Golden Girls. Yes, you can berate me in the comments down below. But right, enough about the chickens, let's dive into the questions. So I'm not going to do these in any specific order, it's just the way that I've kind of listed them on here, so there's no preferential treatment, if that makes sense. It is just random. So the first one that I got is, if I could only pick one philodendron to have, which one would it be? <laughs> the people that have been here for a while, can you guess what I'm going to say? <laughs> it does take center stage in most of my videos, and I think there are three. So the philodendron is Merrill Dense, for the people that might not be aware, which is one plant, it's propagate and another propagate at the top there. And it's kind of spurred on a whole bunch of other plant purchases. For instance, I don't know, I think, oh yes, you can. This is the Anthurium Esmeraldense next to the Philodendron Esmeraldense. And up here we have the Philodendron Esmeralda Spirit, which is a hybrid between the Philodendron Esmeraldense and the Spiritus Sancti. And I have got some other ruffly ones down here as well, more on the Ethereum side. But yes, I think after this long, or at least currently, I am really vibing with the kind of strappy shield type leafed Ethereums or plants generally at the moment. I've kind of I'm not necessarily fallen out of love with the kind of standard kind of heart shape, I'm trying to think of heart shaped leaves now, I don't think I've got any at the moment here, that should tell you something. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot more around me basically, but yeah, I don't know if I've fallen necessarily out of love with them, but you know, oh actually no, I do have a heart shaped philodendron, let me show you. So this is the philodendron majestic, and for the life of me I cannot remember what the mix is, I think, I'll put it up the top there, I think it's Philodendron Varicosum with Philodendron Sorderoi, I think, but I'll bring it in a bit closer so you might be able to see some of that. Coming up a bit grey, but it is quite silvery. This is a plant that is very special because I've been wanting to get it for a while, I don't think most people were aware that I've been wanting to get this one for a while. And one of you lovely lot actually, who's a long time viewer and kind of a bit of a planty friend now as well on Instagram, was selling a rooted cutting 
that um, had grown in their collection, basically. So I just went, can I please buy it? So, but yes, an example of a heart-shaped philodendron leaf. Don't know why, but I thought I'd show you. Yeah. The next one is an interesting one, and I'm not going to necessarily going to be able to answer this one well, but it's saying, are there any tips for the Hydnophytum papuanum, I will put the name at the top there, or similar species? And I actually had to Google this plant because I've never heard the Latin name for it. I know more the common name of this. And I think this is called the ant plant, or the ant, ants, 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 ants. Oh, my English pronunciation for a few things is always a bit hit and miss. Forum, forum is one that I always get like really muddled up with and ants sometimes sounds like ants for me. So, um, but I will put it at the top there. Essentially, I don't have this plant, so I wouldn't really be able to comment. I can make some assumptions. It looks from what I can see online when I was looking at it, it looks like a kind of almost slightly succulent, slightly cordisiform plant. And for the people that don't know, it's quite interesting. Imagine like a big bulbous tuber-like structure, usually above the soil level. There's usually some stems and leaves at the top there, but that bulbule has got, I've not got no better way of describing it as far as I can tell basically from images again, it's got little alleyways and corridors that ants can go in and kind of potentially use that as a bit of a home. It is a great example, however, of how plants can be, can have kind of a symbiotic relationship with ants, or oh, ants, ants, with ants. See what I mean? Oh, this, this, this question is going to be a struggle, I think. But yeah, it is one of those things, like for instance, for a lot of people that have been here for a while, I talk all the time about extra floral nectaries, and it's that sugary, syrupy substance that you might sometimes get on petioles, on stems, on the back of leaves sometimes. And it's usually the plants calling in the ants as cavalry to maybe protect it against pests. These plants kind of do that at a whole other level, basically. If you've never seen one of these ant plants, do do a quick Google. They are spectacular. But yeah, sadly, I won't be able to advise too much. My advice would probably be treat it like a succulent or a codiciform, probably more a codiciform, I would imagine, but don't take my word for it. <laughs> if anybody does have one of these plants and they want to drop their answer down below, I think the person who asked the question would really appreciate that. So the next question is an interesting one. Which is my favorite way to grow plants in semi-hydro or in soil basically or an aroid mix or a soil mix of if any any kind this is a tricky one i don't necessarily have preference and i'm trying to think ones that i can potentially show you so i have preferences depending on genuses basically so let's pick up one so a calathea generally i have tried it in semi-hydro and i know from all of you that some of you have managed to grow it beautifully in semi-hydro. I prefer a soil mix for my kind of calatheas. Ferns can still grow in semi-hydro. Actually, I think with ferns, I'd prefer them in a semi-hydro mix. But things, for instance, like Monstera. So this is a Monstera pina partita, basically. And this is the calathea that I recently mentioned on one of the videos that might be a white fusion or it might be a white wonder, white miracle, I think is the, the other word for it. But it's just my own personal preference. The thing that I will always grow in semi-hydro, I have attempted to, well, <laughs> I say attempted, I've considered growing it in a mix and soil mix. And I had struggles with this before. Let me put down plants is anthuriums. Anthuriums for me grow exceptionally well in semi-hydro. And this was something that I was trying to find when I was first starting off with anthuriums. And a lot of people were growing it predominantly in some version of a soil mix, but they were looking like, they, it looked like there was a lot of parameters to kind of keep in mind. And it kind of felt a bit like you're spinning a lot of plates at the same time. However, when the same people started growing in semi-hydro, either Lecca or Lechuza Pond or a DIY semi-hydro mix, they said that things got easier. 
and I have grown on theorems in both. And I will say I agree with them full heartedly. Game changer when it comes to growing on theorems in semi hydro. Just absolute game changer. There are other things that you need to be looking out for. And if you want me to do a video more extensively on this, I can. I've, I've done it for a few years now. I can talk from a bit more experience than a couple of years ago when I was first starting off with the technique. But in answer to the original question, it's kind of plant or genus specific. The other layer to that, and again I've mentioned this on a previous video, is I actually grow a lot of my plants in semi-hydro because for me, and I know this hasn't been the case for everybody, my recent kind of uh, all to do about semi-hydro two years later kind of told me in terms of the comments, for me my plants in semi-hydro grow slower and they, they remain a bit more compact. So if I've got a plant that I know could get huge, but I prefer it to be in a slightly smaller size, I would definitely put it in a semi-hydro. If there's a plant, for me again, based on kind of how I treat my plants, if there's a plant that I really want to see size up, I will then move it into a soil mix. For me, that's kind of how it has always worked with my plants in my care. This is a good one. This uh, person who was questioning was saying, I purchased this in Esmeraldense Narrow after seeing yours. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I think I'm enabling a few people, quite a few people actually with Esmeraldense. Hopefully you enjoy the plant and hopefully you're not going to curse my name in the next few months. How much do I fertilize is the question essentially. So this is an interesting one. And I don't know if I've ever mentioned this, I pretty much fertilize all my plants in the same way at the same time. This works for me, it might not work for all of you, and this might be shocking because I go against a lot of the kind of standard um, advice out there. And as I said, this works for me, it might not work for everybody. Find what works for you. But with most of my plants, because I use my kind of preferred fertilizer for a good few years now, which is liquid gold leaf, it means that I can fertilize my semi-hydro plants and with that, usually it's a very, very weak dilution of the, um, the actual fertilizer itself. So let me give you an idea. So usually it's two milliliters, I think it's one or two, two, I think it's two milliliters of the fertilizer in a liter of water if you're doing it in soil. And if it's in semi-hydro, it's between half a milliliter to one milliliter per water would work for semi-hydro. What I do is that Every time I water it, there are exceptions, obviously, things like succulents, not succulents, yeah, succulents actually, succulents, cacti, and any plant that I have that is carnivorous, they won't get this, but, or plants generally that don't want or need fertilizer, they won't get it, they will have their own separate watering, but pretty much everything else, I fill up my five liter watering can, and I kind of add in the semi-hydro ratios. So usually I do half a milliliter per liter of water and everything gets watered with the same thing for every watering. That's how I fertilize mine. And to be fair, because the amounts are so small, yes, it's happening every time I'm watering, but because the amounts are so small, I have never had any issue with chemical burns on any of my plants in any media. So as I said, it's working for me it might not work for all of you, but the question was, how do I fertilize or how much do I fertilize? Hopefully that covers you in terms of an answer. So the next question is an interesting one. It asks, what plant has surprised you and become one of your favorites? This is not the favorite, because the favorite we've already covered is the Esmeraldense, but a plant that surprised me and has become a really beloved plant for me and again, the people that have been here for a while will probably be aware of what I'm about to show you now. Is and it really surprised me. You truly did. This is the Philodendron heterocraspidum, and you can see the air layering that I've done at the top there. And there is a question about air layering, and I will come to it in just a minute. There is a newest leaf. And this is the second purchase because I fell in love with it so, so much. The first purchase kind of went downhill really quickly. It was an equigenera purchase. It was coming in during the colder months of the year. 
this was just an add-on that I added onto the basket because I looked at it on the website and just went, oh, that looks interesting, never heard of it before. But then it arrived into my care and I almost entirely kind of like love at first sight. I was just like, oh, so glad I got this. And it really went downhill to the point that I ended up buying a second one. And this is a second one and it's doing a lot better. I'm not entirely sure that the roots are actually anything other than mush at the bottom there. But then I added the air layering to provide it with some much needed moisture if the roots were rotted down below. I don't want to mess with it too, too much at the moment. I might check it in a couple of months time, but it has been growing roots like mad in the actual air layering section. So that will be chopped up soon and moved back into the pot so we can actually start rooting out properly. That plant is another good example and it sits right here behind me. You might be able to see it in some of the videos, you might not. It does wobble precariously, so I need to put it in a very specific spot because otherwise the fan might blow it off. But that is also a plant that coming back to the question we are talking about semi-hydro versus soil before, that is one that I tried in semi-hydro, it didn't do very well. It might have been because the plant was already struggling, so eventually I put it into soil and it's living its best life basically. I do have the original cuttings that did survive from that first purchase that is growing in semi-hydro, it's going okay, it's not doing great, it's not loving life. That might get moved into a soil mix whilst it still has some roots. Next question is a very controversial one. What is your favorite genus of plants? Or what is my favorite genus of plants? <laughs> I hate using kind of examples like this. It is like asking a parent to choose their favorite child. Uh, I am aware that my plants are not my children, but yeah. Um, I don't know. It's an interesting one because most people might assume that I would go with philodendron or monstera, philodendron or anthurium based on how many I've got, but I do love quite a few of my monstera. One that did surprise me, it's not my top top favourite, but it did surprise me and it got to my favourite quite quickly, is the pipers. I do enjoy the pipers. But yeah, it's difficult for me to say. I, I'll do a cop out and just kind of say philodendrons, anthuriums, monstera. Syngoniums I'm not so fussed about. Amidrooms, I'm okay with, but I could take them or leave them. Skindapsis, eh, I've got a couple. They don't light my world on fire. The the prayer plants, any of the prayer plants, again, doesn't set my world on fire. I, I am going to go with the cliches that everybody says, which is Anthuriums, Philodendrons, and Monstera, purely because, and I think this is telling, and it's probably why it's they are favorite genuses for a lot of people. Out of a lot of the house plants that we might be able to get, they tend to be the least fussy ones. Oh, and I just remembered one as well, Epipremnums. I do love a good Epipremnum. I've got the Amplicium, the Marble Queen, the Enjoy. What else have I got? I've got the Skeleton Key. Oh, obviously the Neons, the Golden Pothoses and all these things. I do love myself an Epipremnum because again, out of all of these plants, that's possibly the least fussy out of all of them. It doesn't matter which one you've got. Generally, I find that Epipremnums tend to just keep on keeping on really. Next question is an interesting one. What are my top five wish list plants? I will not answer this question purely because there is an updated wish list video coming up soon. If you do want to check out the wish list video that I did last year, I will link it at the top there. Spoiler, some of those plants that were on that original wish list have since arrived. So I do now have them in my collection. Kind of happy about that. <laughs> That's actually. I need to go back and have a look at that original wish list, but I think a lot of them actually are now part of this collection. Even the ones that I did not assume, like the Spirit of Sancti a year ago, I'm just like, it's never going to happen, it's ridiculously expensive. <laughs> I now have a Spirit of Sancti. <laughs> I'm still pinching myself. I know the prices have dropped down and they probably will drop even further, but the memo from five years ago is still very thrilled and surprised that this is even a thing, basically. I can show you a bit of an update of that one if you want. 
So it's looking a bit happier at the moment. It's looking a bit more turgid. This is one of its newest leaves. Remember there was a bend in the leaf. It didn't seem to affect it in any way or form. The leaves are okay. I have kind of used a janky support stick here just purely because I don't want that flopping down entirely. But there is already a new growth point that's coming in there. Really, really good. And it is rooting in beautifully. I might be able to show you some of the roots. You can see them peeping through some of the slits on the pot. So very, very good. So far, it doesn't seem to be a difficult plant, that would. Um, I do kind of maybe see that it's not the fastest thing in the world, but saying that though, it's already brought one leaf. One leaf was unfurling when it came to me. This is the leaf that's fully in my care and there's already another one going. And I don't think I've had this plant for that long. So actually, good, it's tiny, but it will get bigger, it's fine. I don't know where I'm going to put this when it gets bigger. Future memo problem, but some of these things are starting to keep me up at night at this point. Again, another question that I'm not going to answer for a good reason is what are my plant pet peeves? It's as if you knew that I was going to be doing a video recently. So that was one of the most recent videos that I brought out, so I will link it at the top there. There's a whole bunch of plant peeves on there. Kind of the major one I think for me still on that one is kind of getting plants that are sapping wet potentially places like um, big box stores. A lot of you actually, and I will actually know, you know what, I will put the spotlight on all of you. There was a lot of comments on there that I hadn't thought about, but you are entirely right. Baby plants or smaller plants, not always just the small plants, sometimes it's for the bigger plants. This predominantly will apply to big kind of box stores, maybe supermarkets, maybe less specialist plant stores, where it just says like you get a calathea and it's like calathea mix. And it's just like, or you buy a philodendron hastatum, like a silver stored uh, philodendron, and it just says philodendron. And it's just like, okay, that's something. You've given me the genus. It would have been really nice to know the species. A lot of you did make good points that half of the fun, <laughs> the experience is trying to figure out what you've got. So yeah, and top tip on that one, I know a lot of apps were trying to do this for a while. I don't know if any of you use kind of Google image search. So a lot of times on the phone, you can take a picture. And when you go to search, you can click the little camera icon, pop that image in, and it will spit out a whole bunch of results and images, possibly some answers as to what it is you might own. So, and it's free. So it's a way to potentially find out. I don't know why I put it down. I did say I was going to come back to it. So air layering question. I think what was the question? How long do I leave air layering on before I do the chop? <laughs> so the wrong person to be asking this question because I am a lazy. For instance, this plant with this many roots kind of buckling out of the air layer probably should have been cut a while back. It depends. I don't find that there's a lot of hard and fast rules when it comes to air layering for me. So a lot of people will be like, if it's X long, the roots in there, then chop it up. A lot of the times what I would like to see, it doesn't always happen by the time I chop it up, is I want to see main roots and I want to see secondary roots. So these are the smaller roots that come off those kind of bigger, thicker roots. That point is when I will consider cutting it and just going, you know what, it will go into whatever media it needs to be. But there's no hard and fast kind of time frame for me in terms of when I do that. I just kind of keep an eye on it. And a lot of the times, like for instance, this one, I wasn't air layering because I necessarily wanted to cut it. I was air layering because I needed to get some moisture into the plant as all of the roots at the very bottom had rotted out. So I'm hoping eventually they will kind of come back in. I'm not entirely sure. The the stem isn't getting mushy, so I don't know, possibly, but it's in the most airy soil mix that I can give it. So time will tell. And it's not struggling in the slightest. They might just be getting all of the moisture down from the air layering. But I will say, if the roots in the bottom were entirely dead, some of these lower leaves, I would have assumed by now would have died off. Because that's this has been like this for three months, I would say. 
So yeah, whether or not that moisture is going down the stem, I don't know. It might do, but yeah, no hard and fast answer with this one. It's it's kind of like I base it on when I feel like it or when I see it that it's had a few roots and maybe some secondary roots, and that's probably when I would cut it. So this is another good one. The, the question is, how did my journey begin? Is there a plant that started it all? And I hate to be that, that kind of broken record. I have done a longer video, so I will link it at the top there so you can go and check it out. I've got my journey throughout everything basically, but I'll give you kind of cliff notes. And apologies for the people that have heard this several times over. So I started my plant journey very young. I think I was four or five. My mother had her house plants on the balcony, probably at least a hundred. Thinking back on it now, I'd never kind of really took the time to think about it and just went, oh no, we had an awful lot of house plants basically, or balcony plants at that point, Cyprus. <laughs> kind of very close to Egypt as well, if it gives you an idea of kind of temperatures generally. But one of my first chores as a child was taking care of those plants. Then I kind of grew up, I became an older child, I became a teenager, kind of lost touch with a lot of the plants that I was enjoying because I always saw that as a bit of a chore. But then I went to university for my first degree and I think my mother gave me a pothos cutting. To, and I don't know why I didn't just buy a pothos here in the UK and I had to bring it with me all the way from Greece. This was when it was before Brexit time, so theoretically I wasn't breaking any laws at that point. But yeah, so I bought the plant over, the cutting, I rooted it up, did really well. And I had friends who at that point noticed that I was really kind of finding myself and really enjoying caring for these plants, but they never said anything. Many, many years later, I, I think there was a plant store in a market right next to where I used to work, and I went there and I got, it might have been a bonsai, a polka dot begonia, a ficus that was in a glass terrarium. I'll see if I can find some pictures and add them here. And basically that whole situation kick-started the madness that is now. So not necessarily one specific plant, but a few plants along the way. And I think the moment, the aha moment for me didn't even come from me. It came from those same friends that noticed that I was enjoying caring for the plants when I was still a student. And when I got plants, I just, oh yeah, you always kind of like seemed really happy and content when you were taking care of the plants. It's really nice to see you getting back into it. And that's like, it's sometimes, it's only when you see yourself through other people's eyes that you can see something that's always been right in front of you. And they're completely right. This is my Zen moment now, and I still massively enjoy it. Ah, uh, this is a good question. So they say that they're a new and very amateur plant parent. Any simple tips about being a good plant parent? <laughs> Wouldn't we all like the silver bullet that we can kind of say, do exactly these things when you're starting off and you will kind of be fine. I'll twist this question on its head slightly and not necessarily tips, but I'll give you some advice. Don't beat yourself up. We all make mistakes when we're first starting off. That's how we learn. And that is the fastest way that we're gonna learn and that you're gonna learn as well with this. Maybe, <laughs> If you're starting off, start with some of the plants that everybody and their mothers, grandmothers, whole family tree behind them have owned in the past and have kept alive, even probably people that you didn't think would be able to keep a plant alive, because it will make your life easier. And then start adding in things that might be considered a bit trickier. Don't believe everything you see on the internet. Don't believe the labels 100% that come into the plants because this was again something that came up in my plant peeves video and somebody was just like, the plant care labels on some of these plants are exactly the same for all of them and none of them are specific enough. Yes, this is true. So start is the same thing. I, whenever, I, whenever anybody asks me about starting anything, a hobby, something that they might be end up being passionate about, all these things, there's an old, there's a very ancient Greek saying, which is, um, I think, 
I might be butchering this. Any Greeks out there, I'm really sorry if I really massacred that. But essentially what that translates to is the beginning is half of everything. So the the kind of thought process behind that, it's the same thing when you when you're procrastinating and you need to get a task done or the um, or you need to do uh, something for work or you need to do something for school and you kind of keep putting it off. How true does it ring that when you eventually start it, you're already half finished? It's that kind of notion. So with this is just get going, just get going and you'll learn along the way. And arguably those lessons are going to be better than anything me or anybody online will be able to teach you. Yeah, you can, we all kind of use websites, information sources, books, YouTubers, anything like this to gather information and see how other people are experiencing it. But I, like I always say, you are your own unique person and your care is gonna be very different from everybody else's. Your environment might be very different from everybody else's. Try things out. And again, don't be hard on yourself. You do not want to know how many plants I've killed along the way. <laughs>
Do I believe the plants need support? Yes. Do I believe that all of them need support? Not necessarily, it depends on the plant, basically. Do I agree that plants will get bigger leaves if they are given a moss pole? Yes, generally, there's a caveat there. So I've seen a lot of people, and I think a lot of people were taking inspiration from the lovely individual that is, I think, Sydney Plant Guy, um, who's got massive plants. His method is amazing on how he grows things with the moss poles. And I think the most important thing for me when I was looking at how he was doing it, when I was trying to start doing that, I even tried doing my own moss poles with a clear back. Uh, let me see if I can bring one to show you. Something that isn't attached to a wall. I'll see if I can get a picture or a video, because at the moment it's, it's proving difficult. Um, oh, actually, no, let me show you. So these types of moss poles. So clear back, sphagnum moss, quar chips inside, just because otherwise it was getting really expensive and very, very heavy. But yes, I have done this, and yes, I do it with plants that I want to get slightly larger leaves. Just to be clear, this Escaletto hasn't attached yet to the moss pole. So it did this all on its own. Why don't I use them more? And I, I did use, like for instance, with my skeleton key, it came on a moss pole or a quar pole, the ones that you get in the supermarkets already attached. It was a quite mature plant. I'm not gonna mess with that. So I just added another one that was exactly the same. Why don't I use them if they've got benefits? The simple answer for me is hassle. I'm going to be blunt about this. If people have a smaller collection, so I don't think Sydney Plant Guy's collection is small. I think it's quite sizable. I think it's over 100 plants. Um, I think I was seeing recently that the plants have all been moved into the garden. So even he was saying it's a lot easier to water now because he can just spray things down out in the garden. It's a lot faster. Can you imagine if every single one of these plants had that moss pole and I had to keep it moist? I've always struggled to keep those moss poles moist as well. I've sometimes put wicking rope on the inside of that. That didn't help too much. It just, it's a lot for me. It's a lot. I would much rather grow them on a plank because I don't need to keep misting it. It will just attach. Does it take a bit longer on a plank to get big, big leaves versus a moss pole that might have a bit more moisture on it? Yes. Is it harder because you can't really then, basically with the moss pole, like the one I was showing you a moment ago, you can theoretically, if you've got roots growing into the moss, you can just chop it. Because essentially what you've done there is a glorified air layering process. So you can chop it off and it's already got some roots and you can pot it up somewhere else. So there's a lot of benefits for me, for my size of a collection and for my plants, which again, I will say that I, would, I wouldn't mind them staying a bit smaller. It's just too much of a faff. That, that's my honest answer for that one. Ah, another hefty question. What is my specific fertilizer routine for spring and autumn? And again, this might shock you. Coming back to the original, one of the other answers that I gave, my fertilizing doesn't change throughout the year. Because I've fertilized so weakly for every watering, it's the same in summer, spring, autumn, and winter. Sometimes in winter, I might pull back ever so slightly if I'm seeing that the plant really hasn't done very much. But most of my plants are still actively growing in winter time as well. So they still get fertilizer, very, very weak fertilizer like they do for the rest of the year. Seems to be happy. I don't change the levels. I'm gonna be honest, I have struggled and I'm dreading Kind of like a 50 50 situation. I am dreading and looking forward to autumn and winter. Looking forward because there's a lot less watering that needs to happen, so I can take it a bit easier and not have to do quite as many things that I'm currently doing. Dreading because every year that I've had my collection, I lose the majority of my plants, usually in that transitional period between summer, autumn, and winter, basically. By the time winter rolls into spring, things are picking up again, so that's fine. But I lose a lot of plants, and it's predominantly happened every year because I don't adjust my watering fast enough to less watering over the winter months versus the summer months. 
So I am hoping this year on my plant care app, there is a winter setting and a summer setting. A lot of the times the difference is, so for instance, one plant in the winter, because I've had it for years now, gets watered or checked and then watered every 14 days. But in the summer, that exact same plant might get watered every three to four days. So that transitional period for me, and I could do it slowly and taper it. I've got too many plants and I can't always afford to do that. And the way that I see it with some of my plants is survival of the fittest. Can you do it? If there are a couple of plants that I need to baby, so for instance, the Anthurium cuticuense. Oh, and let me show you. Shockingly, it's still alive. I've now got the first leaf with the three kind of leaves. Oh, and there's a new one. See, I like doing videos like this because then I can see new leaves coming through. Uh, I did lose one of its bottom leaves, but that was fine. I can't see any substantial roots coming in. I wasn't entirely convinced that it wasn't getting any root rot. I did put some sphagnum moss collar around because it was getting some aerial roots coming out and I want to encourage those. This is surviving. It doesn't mean it's still not gonna die on me. Um, but for instance, something like this, I probably will baby and I will do that more gradual transition in terms of watering, not necessarily the fertilizer, the only exception, there is an exception with a fertilizer, is if a plant has pretty much lost most of its roots to root rot and it's rehabbing, that plant probably won't get fertilizer because that will just stress out the situation more. But something like this, which is maybe a bit more special, which is something I want to baby a bit more, but actively doing it, there's only like a few that might be in my collection, this one will get that slower transition. Coming into the personal questions, and if you don't want to be here for the personal questions, I hope you enjoyed all the planty questions, and hopefully I shall see you all soon. For the people that do want to know the personal questions and answers, this one's for you. So let's start with the first one. What do I do for a living? Without giving away too much on the internet, because internet, um, I work in kind of digital marketing and web design, basically. So I've been doing that for a few years. The backstory, I don't know if I ever went into too much detail on this. My first degree was a human anatomy degree. And yeah, it was me in dissection rooms with cadavers because at that point, my scientific brain wanted me to go into medicine and possibly plastic surgery. So I thought the anatomy side of things, and I did enjoy it drastically, but I think for me, it's that realization after doing that degree and doing it for three years of kind of going, I now have another six years, five or six years of medicine, however many years of residency, however many years of specialization and all of these things. And I'm just like, I cannot be a starving student for the next 15 years. I found that exceptionally difficult. So I stopped at that point with that one and then immediately did a degree, a humanities degree, which was hysterical for me, humanities degree, which was in tourism with business. My family has got a tourism business. So I've been around that for a lot of my life. People are very surprised. They're just like, how did one go to the other? I'm just like, those were my, my two big things from day one. So, but then finished my tourism degree right in time for the 2008 uh, recession like a lot of my generation did. That was fun. Um, but at that point, I started off a patisserie, my own business. And I've talked about my stresses, getting a degree and getting a good grade, knowing full well that I was always going to work for myself. So I'm just like, why am I stressing? Uh, just so I can prove something to myself. It's fine. I don't need to get sick to do this. Um, and yeah, that was, that was that basically. And then the digital marketing, the website side of things, came from that original business. And ironically enough, this is the industry that I've been in for the longest, I think probably over more or less since 2008, in one way or another, because I had to do my own website for the shop. I was very much on a very tight budget. I did my own website. I did my own digital marketing because a lot of people weren't using digital marketing at that point. It was so much easier to get anything done properly and get some great results for very little effort. If I did the effort that I did back then, now <laughs> nothing would ever work. But yeah, and I've worked for other agencies. I've set up my own agency, but essentially I am a freelancer. It gives me an awful lot of time to do things that I need to do. I can slot things that I need to do around my work day. So if I need to potentially take the dog to the vets if he's not feeling well, which unfortunately Duke, for the people that have been around for a while, has got a poorly uh, stomach at the moment, so. <laughs> 
Poonami comes to mind, essentially. Turns out that every other dog in the neighborhood has also got something. So I'm assuming they all kind of gave it to each other one way or another, basically. But I can do that because I'm a freelancer. I can kind of move things in my schedule around. I get to choose, it sounds horrible, but I get to choose the clients that I work with and the clients that I enjoy working with. Agency life was great when I was working for a digital agency, but there was an awful lot of politics that I just really couldn't be bothered with. There was a lot of pressure, basically. And I think for me, because I'd run a business so early on in my life, prior to that, I'm sitting there going, I am physically going gray. I'm getting a lot of stress-related health issues. And it's going to sound really blunt. Or somebody else's business. That doesn't compute well in my brain. So I'm just like, I would much rather have my own business. Yes, I will have stresses, different stresses, possibly more stresses. But at the end of the day, it's my business. It's my baby, basically. So there is that. So it's always, <laughs> it's always a bit of a balance on like, yeah, finding things to do. My work day never really ends and my work week never really ends. And I have heard all of you. I will get some downtime, I promise. I'm hoping towards the end of August, I might take a week off. I would have still filmed and edited, but if it doesn't happen, I do apologize in advance. I kind of need to take a break for like a week. I don't think I've had a proper holiday in a couple of years, two or three years. So I think I need to decompress a bit basically. But yeah, so that's kind of what I do for a living. Very long-winded, but I know people will hear sometimes to the chats as well. Good, next question. How many countries have I been to? So this is a tricky one because I don't think I've ever necessarily counted, but coming back to the previous question, my family is, is kind of livelihood and business is within tourism. Granted, it's within a specific location of the Med, but it has basically meant that ever since I can remember, I've been on trains, planes, buses, cars, boats, anything you name it, I have always traveled and I still massively enjoy traveling. Bizarrely enough, the older I get, the more fearful I've become of flying on occasions. And it's just been because of uh, some really bad long haul flights that were turbulent for nearly eight to 10 hours. Uh, that, um, so it's, it's that, and I know, I've done work towards relieving that and it did work quite well. Interestingly, randomly enough, I did a job many years ago where I was a VAT auditor. I don't do finance, but uh, but we used to get flown out from the UK to Europe every week. So my Monday commute was a flight to somewhere in Europe. We would go to the client's place of business, do their auditing, and then come back on the Friday, have the weekend in the UK. I was living in London at that point and then do the same thing the next day, the next week, basically. So epic amount of packing and unpacking, it was painful. I don't regret doing it, I had a good time, but this is a very long way of me saying a fear of flying. I went with a lot of people on these flights that we were working with, and a lot of people that did this profession for years were petrified of flying, and I'm just like, why are you doing this to yourself? And they're just like, oh, we thought it would help us with the fear of flying, as in like more exposure, less fearful, and I'm just like, You've been doing this for five to six years and you are still petrified. Maybe that's not working for you, basically. So, I don't know. But yeah, I've traveled a lot. This is a very long way of saying, I don't necessarily know how many countries I've been to. I haven't been to the Far East at all. I would love to go to the Far East. Um, Japan is on my bucket list. It's one of the languages that I learned because I find the Japanese culture very interesting, the good and the bad, because I know a lot of people just see the good side of things. And it's like, oh, anime and the kawaii and all these things. And I like, no, I like the good and the bad. Ironically enough, Japanese culture, believe it or not, is very similar in its customs and traditions and kind of politeness and way that things need to be done, like the Greek culture. So that's quite, I'm, I'm used to that and I don't mind it necessarily. I don't know. So many tangents on these personal questions, I do apologize. But yeah, so I'd love to go to the Far East. I've done quite a bit of the States. I haven't done South America, I haven't done Canada. I would love to do that. I've done quite a lot of Europe and kind of bits of Africa as well. Usually the bits that kind of 
bordered the Med. I would like to go and experience Africa a bit more and go to places. So I went to very international schools growing up. So I had friends from Kenya, Nairobi, South Africa, Somalia, all of these places that I would love to go and visit at some point because knowing these individuals and getting to experience the culture, their own culture through them, it's just like mind blowing. I do want to go and visit at some point. Australia, New Zealand, all these places I haven't been to, but yeah, predominantly I've done most of Europe at this point, I would say. So count countries essentially. And yeah. Now finish off with a with a really interesting question. Valid question. Uh, how many piercings do I have? Any backstory about them? <laughs> So I don't think I've ever counted. So I've obviously got my septum, I've got a tongue ring, I've got, so I'm two, I've got tragus, no tragus is here. This was originally a scaffold or industrial, but this area here got infected. So that's the only one that's left there now. I used to have the boobs done as well, or one of them, that didn't go well and a belly button piercing, which I think that's probably the only one that's got both the tongue and the belly button are my oldest piercings. The belly button I have had, oh, 23 years. And the tongue piercing probably about the same actually. So those are the ones. And the only reason why they've got kind of like stories behind them is because I was a kid and I probably shouldn't have done it. And I didn't really get adults permission. I just did it because I was that child or that teenager <laughs> oh dear um but yeah it was those ones are the ones that i remember well because yeah oh, actually i can tell you a story about the belly button piercing <laughs> i was living without going into too much details i was living in a boarding school for a year and i had both of those piercings done when i was in boarding school and i really wasn't supposed to be doing them not just for parents but also the house parents in the boarding school and I remember I was getting my belly button done and it was like a ring and it was a captured ball and I was a kid and I was just like, oh, I need to do something and take it out. I don't know why I needed to take, oh, I, knew, I wanted to take out the, the, the captured ball for some reason. I hate captured ball um, rings because they're a pain to put back in. Um, took the ball out, couldn't get it back in and I was worried that obviously I'd gone through all this trouble and trying to get this in. So... Fast forward to me talking to one of the other kids who was a friend of mine in that house, basically at that boarding school, and just went, can you go and can, can you help me with this? And then they found some pliers, which I'm pretty sure were quite rusty. Do not do this at <laughs> And they were helping kind of me to open up that ring so I can get the capture ball in. Everything bruised, all of these things. How it's healed and it's fine, and it, you couldn't tell any of this, and it's still there. However many years later, I don't know. But that is a, that's a memory that I've got in my brain, basically. But <laughs> and on that pleasant note, I think that's all of the questions that I got. Hopefully, you've all enjoyed this. Uh, if you enjoy these Q and A type videos, do let me know down below, and I can always do them again. Um, but yeah. Hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.